Шановні пані панове, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome at Kyiv Center, uh, Kyiv UP Center, and today we are gathered as a pre-conference uh, uh, seminar. Um, the topic of this, of this uh, discussion and the topic of our seminar brings up a lot of discussion. And uh, I heard at least two positions. Some people do agree that there is post-truth problem, and the other people just uh, keep denying, <coughs> saying that the post-truth is a fake problem made up by media. So, but once it comes to the public discourse, it cannot be ignored. And today we gather um, together to discuss the problem of post-truth, and uh, I have a privilege to introduce our uh, speakers. Uh, right to me is uh, Avishai Margali, Shulman Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, former George Cannon Professor at Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, um, author of the famous book, Decent Society, Ethics of Memory, Uncompromised and Rotten Compromises. His uh, recent publication was on betrayal. Uh, Dr. Margalit is also um, uh, receiver of Israel Prize in Philosophy in 2010, Ernst Bloch Prize uh, 2012, uh, Spinoza Lens Prize, EMT Prize, and so um, he also was the professor at Harvard University, uh, in Oxford University, in the Free University of Berlin, Institute of Max Planck in Berlin, and uh, well, I think. Um, People who gathered here know Dr. Margalit by his publications, and uh, uh, though none of his books were translated in Russian or in Ukrainian, he is well known also in academic circles in Ukraine, but just reinforcing how well we know. Uh, <coughs> next to him is our uh, friend and colleague Valeria Koroblova, professor of philosophy at Kyiv Shevchenko National University. Um, co-editor of the Topos uh, journal, famous, uh, Carnegie Fellow at Stanford University, uh, Fellow of Institute for Human Sciences, um, uh, Fellow of Artis Liberalis program in Warsaw University, and Fellow of many other programs, and the author of the um, uh, book on uh, social senses of ideology, published in 2014. Um, Valeria's interest um, our ideological studies, social philosophy, uh, contemporary political philosophy. Um, uh, next to Valeria is Alexei Panich. Uh, Alexei Panich, also well known in these circles. But let me just uh, reintroduce our guest, professor of philosophy, senior researcher of Duch and Litera Publishing House, member of supervisory board of the public broadcasting company of Ukraine, uh, he has numerous publications on logics, epistemology, skepticism. Uh, in recent years, uh, Professor Panich is translating philosophical texts into Ukrainian, which I believe is a profound work considering the context of Ukrainian philosophy and the importance of uh, these works to be introduced into Ukrainian uh, philosophical discourse and public discourse. And also our um, last but not least guest <laughs> is our uh, Polish friend, Professor Leszek Kocianowicz, Professor of Philosophy at the um, Department of Social Psychology in faculty um, in Wrocław of the University of Social Sciences and Humanities. Professor Kocianowicz is also a fellow of numerous uh, fellowships, but he's also um, uh, recently, he published a book on politics of time, dynamics of identity in post-communist Poland. Uh, he published a book on uh, uh, Mead, his interests are also political philosophy, philosophy uh, uh, of American pragmatism, um, and uh, uh, the social and political processes happening in the post-Soviet societies, specifically in Poland. Uh, we will work in the following way. Uh, our presenters will uh, say uh, shortly about, on what they consider to be most important to be said. We will start discussion with the uh, short introduction by uh, our speakers, and then we will launch the discussion with public and talk about this widely. So um, 
welcome. And if I may uh, ask you to talk into the microphone. Well, first, thank you for having me. And uh, what you want me to talk is the truth about post-truth. And that's not an easy thing to do. Cynicism about truth is an old thing. When Pontus Pilatus asks what is truth in a cynical way, a jesting uh, Pontus Pilatus, and uh, as Francis Bacon said, he didn't wait for an answer. So that's a cynical attitude to truth is not something new. And the propaganda and, and demagoguery is not something new. And manipulation in politics and twisting and spinning and spin doctors, there is nothing new in that. So why suddenly a concern with post-truth? First of all, the concern is in places where you can know better the truth, namely that the public domain is relatively free, the access to the media, variety of EIF. There is a way in those places to trying to control the media, like Berlusconi having three television channels and so on. But the main thing in those places, if in a way you want to know the truth, let's say factual truth, there are ways of doing it, not I mean, easier or harder, but basically it's accessible. So the issue about truth is not about truth in general, but what we may say, what in liberal democracies, or what used to be liberal democracies, is the attitude to truth. In a minute, we'll have to say something more specific about it. And there is a feeling of a rise of populism. If that's the, it's a bad term, but still we don't have a, an alternative. To that, uh, suddenly the attitude to factual truth is changing. In the sense, people lied before and they are lying now. That's not the issue. They are not embarrassed to lie now. I mean, finding inconsistencies, logical fallacies, outrageous claims, seems to be less and less intimidating and embarrassing the people who utter them. Suddenly, there is a change in attitude to factual truth among populism. And true, what's the? In populism, first of all, it starts with we, the true people. Populism starts with subsection of the, of, the, of the population as representing the true people. The opposition is to intellectuals, to minorities, but the main thing is that there, are, there is the voice of the true people. And now, what, whether the, and the true people are not terribly interested or concerned about what you, the others, take as truth. So what is substituted by in populism? And by populism, I mean from, from Poland now to Hungary, and I mean, and then of course to I mean the Berlusconi I mentioned, and and the ultimate example, or the Brexiters, some of them, but the ultimate uh, Modi in India. So it's a varied, but, but the ultimate example is obviously Trump, and the idea of alternative truths or fake news and so. On. What is the substitute for truth here? That the true people. are truthful, not in terms of adherence to facts, but they express the emotions truthfully, they are sincere. So Trump is lying, they know. And they, 
but that's not, a, but at least he tells it the way it is in the sense of how we people feel about things, the resentment. And the idea is the following, that there is something in the elite, especially in the educated elite, and their concern about minorities and concern about human rights and the rule of law and all this, that there is something phony about it. That uh, it cannot be true that these privileged people really care about immigrants, about us. It's a phony feeling of solidarity and they are fake people. And at least we the people have both common sense, no matter what we say, and we express, we are sincere. And since it, so Hillary Clinton is a, an emblem of fakeness. As a human, no matter, she knows the statistics, she brings facts, that's irrelevant. Basically, it can be true that anyone with her privileged background can feel what she claims that she's feeling. And so truthfulness now is an attribute not of factual truth or informative truth, or descriptive truth, or what the truth about the world, what the world is like, but it's about how you feel. And the idea is that basically America first, or Ukraine first, or Poland first, namely our people take, take precedence over all the rest. And here there is a tension. People talk about liberal democracy as if it is fish and chips, as if it's two complementary things. If you're liberal, you're also democrat. And there is a tension between the two. People, the true people are democrats. They understand by demo democracy the rule of the majority, majoritarian rule. That's the only meaning. Now we have the majority, it should work for us. That's the idea. Liberalism, caring about civil rights, about human rights, about minorities, looks to them, looks to them liberal is as part of an elite culture. It's not part of what they feel about it or believe. And therefore, usually the first institution to be attacked is the Supreme Court. If there is a liberal institution, the Supreme Court becomes an independent source of this elite to continue to rule after they lost in the election. So the first thing is how to undermine Supreme Courts or constitutional courts. So what I'm, I'll end up because, I mean, we, we have a long, I mean, a long day. So the main claim is it's not the truth vanished or truthfulness vanished. What vanished and transferred is the adherence to factual truth, to information. If you would like to scientific truth, truth about climate change. This is all for the birds. The main thing is we the people should adhere to the people who express what we really feel about the world. The resentment, we can't stand those immigrants, they are very different, they will rule, no matter whether we see them or not. People in, in London voted for, to remain in Europe, and people in the shires uh, who never saw immigrants, they were all for sort of, uh, for Mary England. So the issue is, is truthfulness was replaced by sincerity of nasty feeling. Mm -hmm. and, the code for, and the code for that is political correct. Political correct is the set of all, the etiquette of the elite. Mm -hmm. And the etiquette of the elite is something that we resent. And therefore, to be post-truth, 
means replacing, the way I understand it, replacing truth with this kind of sincerity. And now we have to... Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the organizers. It's a big honor for me to join my distinguished colleagues in discussing this burning issue. I would probably start with an anecdote. Clemenceau is said to have met a representative of the Weimar Republic in 1920s, and he was asked about the reasons and the guilt for World, One, World War I. He was asked, what do you think future historians will write about the causes of World War I? And he responded, that I don't know. What I do know, however, that they will not write that Belgium invaded Germany. And that's sort of a telling case of our intuition about what fact is and what a lie is. And um, this anecdote was described in an essay by Hannah Arendt back in 1967. And I find this essay very uh, urgent, very up to date, actually. She goes on saying, actually for doing that, for making such a claim like Belgium invaded Germany, you need a power to control the whole information area. And surprisingly, she goes on, which is far from inconceivable. So basically, back in 1967, she said, yeah, it can be done. You need some efforts, you need some resources, but it can be done easily. And that's part of the problem we are facing today. Um, I'm grateful to Professor Margulit for making this distinction. I think that it's analytically very powerful that we have to distinguish between different kinds of truth. There is rational truth, scientific truth, philosophical or existential truth, and on the other side you have factual truth. On the everyday level, we tend to think that facts are the most sort of objective, that they resist our coercion to fake them. Hannah Arendt says that they are not, actually, because th facts are a matter of coincidence. Something just happens by coincidence, and there is no external point of reference to validate its truthfulness. So actually facts can be faked because we rely on documents, which can be faked, and we rely on witnesses, which also can be falsified, like false testimonies, right? Um, so factual truth is very vulnerable. But what is going on these days uh, that um, before when people lied, they tried to make a lie look like truth. And if it was disclosed, then it's a failure. And these days, it's another way around. So we are making some efforts to make truth look like an opinion, one of many. So basically what is going on is blurring the distinction between truths and opinions, and that's important. Another point I would also want to borrow from Hannah Arendt is that she says that politics does not inhabit any truth. Politics relies on opinions, actually. But here we need to make a very important distinction, another important distinction between opinions and articulated interests. Because opinion presupposes taking sort of a mental exercise. You have to take into account as many standpoints as you can. What she call, and, and she gets very Kantian here, what Han Arendt calls enlarged mentality. So it's a sort of exercise. If you want to make a really a political judgment, to voice a political opinion, you don't have only to express your particular interests, but you have to take into account as many standpoints as you can. It still will be particular, but you are trying to make an assertive, sort of validated judgment. And what we observe these days, that basically people are trying to close, are trying to articulate in the political domain their interests, their personal interests or their community interests, and that destroys politics. 
uh, people used to think that liberal democracies are sort of immune to any monopoly on truth. And nowadays we see that they are not. And that's also a kind of new phenomenon, right? Um, and probably the last point I would like to make that I'm quite surprised that many intellectuals accuse postmodernism or the French critical theory for that. It's sort of a new common sense these days that it's all about them. They contributed significantly to relativizing the truth. They destroyed the whole concept of truth and now it's being destroyed like factual truth, like it's a, like a consequence of that. Um, I think it's largely unfair because the critical theory was not against the truth. It was against the monopoly on truth or to put it differently, against the political usage of truth. What we observe nowadays is the political usage of post-truth, which is a perverse mode of the very same phenomenon. And uh, my intuition is that precisely the critical theory and discourse analysis provide us with intellectual tools to sort of to counter this tendency to disclose these strategies of political usages of truth or post-truth. Probably I'll stop here. Thank you. Always thanking the organizers because it's a luxury. It happens not so often to have a philosophical Anglophone discussion right here in Kiev, so I enjoy it very much. And thank you for inviting me. So, uh, I would, uh, at the very start, I would say I'm, I am skeptical. I was and I am skeptical towards this notion of uh, post truth because if taken literally, it doesn't make sense to me. What does it mean? Uh, we have left the truth behind. We are moving past truth. Where? There is a precedent. It was a guy about 100 years ago who claimed that we can move beyond good and evil. And this was for him a prelude to the philosophy of the future. And you know what happens next. Uh, when you go beyond good and evil, you may find there a beast or maybe a god all, uh, both assumptions are questionable, but both were expressed, including in, in the history of Christianity. But anyway, you will find nothing human there. There is no human life where there is no distinction between good and evil. Same with the truth. If we go past truth, whatever you can find there, you can find no human life. So when people say this, they mean something else something less radical. Mostly, I guess mostly when people say we are living in the times of post-truth, they mean that truth and falsity are not distinguishable anymore. So we cannot just discern and distinguish which is which. Where is truth, where is, where is lie. But in this case, it's very difficult for me to say what is new in this claim, because it all happened much, much before us, uh, long ago in history, and this very concern was first clearly articulated in European history as long ago as in Aristotle's time, in times of Socrates, in times of sophistics, and people were just as I, uh, they are now, people were shocked that somebody is uh, expressing lies, take, uh, presenting them as truth, and being not embarrassed at all to lie. Even uh, uh, lying ab uh, about the most shameful, as it seems, and the most shameful uh, things. So blurring the distinction between truth and lie, it all also happened before and was expressed clearly. Uh, I refer to Aristophanes, to his clouds. You remember the story where there are two discourses, uh, Dikaios Logos and Adikos Logos, which means uh, just Logos and unjust Logos. They're quarreling, and unjust Logos beats just Logos. And the uh, culmination of their discussion is they, uh, what would you say about homosexualism? Is it shameful? Is it okay? And unjust Logos wins when he says, Homosexualism is, uh, is quite okay. Nothing wrong with it. I can prove it to you. How can you prove it? Very simple. Uh, look at our advocates, who they are. 
Yes. They are sons of, sorry, broad arses. This is in translation. Our poets, tra tragic poets, sons of the same people. Our demagogues. Yes. And our spectators in the audience, look at them. I am looking. What do you see? By God, I know. I know this one and this one and this one. They are all of the same. So uh, just discourse says, I am beaten. I am going to your camp. Uh, the other dialogue close to the end of this uh, comedy is much more significant and much more important. When the son, uh, taught by Sec Socrates how to use unjust discourse, beats his father and says, I can prove you that I can beat you. I have all the rights to beat you. The uh, most curious is not that the son is going to prove it, but the father is so much under the spell of his respect to discursive reasoning that he is ready to listen. He says, OK, I will listen to you. Maybe you can prove it to me. And the son uh, proves it brilliantly. He, uh, I will not repeat it, but there are a number of proofs, like uh, look at the chicken, where uh, sons can beat their father, and what is so wrong with this? And take, just tell me what is so much difference. Where is just a big, uh, such a big difference between humans and chicken? Can you prove it? It's serious. For uh, ancient Greek, it's a serious question. Just remember the story of Diogenes, who brought the cock in the Academy of Plato to show the uh, animal uh, who, uh, according to Plato's definition of a man. Now, the only thing father can uh, say, in, uh, father feels there is the truth, but he cannot express it. He cannot defend it. And the only defense he can find is to refer to tradition. He says uh, in the existing translation uh, I used, but the law nowhere admits that father should be treated then. But in original Greek, he refers not to the law. He, he refers to the custom. In literal translation, there is no such custom anywhere for fathers to endure this. And the son responds, well, who was the first man who established this custom? Somebody, somehow, at some time in the, in the past, persuaded other people to establish this custom. And now I am going to persuade my contemporaries to establish a different custom. So when custom ask, uh, as long as we believe that our customs are going from God, it's more or less uh, sure. But when the customs are human made, where is the truth? We can feel it, we cannot express it, we cannot defend it, and the only response that is left to the father is to take a torch and to burn the house of Socrates. But, of course, we all understand that we, uh, th this means to try to resolve the question of truth by sheer force, which is also not the right thing to do. So not, uh, uh, it was under understood not only by poets, but also by philosophers of this time. And this is the root of Aristotle's insistence on the law of excluded middle. Aristotle says this very clearly that we have to stick to this law, which means stick to the principle that whatever you are uh, talking about, you should clearly affirm or deny. And nothing is be in between. Why it is so important? Because if we allow anything in between, there will be no truth and falsity, and everything, just blurring the distinction, everything will be mixed with everything. I will not quote Aristotle. I have the quotation here. Uh, if you want, I can show it to you in Greek. But the point is like this. Uh, if, unless one speaks for the very sake of speaking, that's my translation from Greek, uh, more precise than the existing trans uh, old uh, translation uh, available online. Uh, unless one speaks for the very sake of speaking, what is beyond right and wrong should be beside the sides of every contradiction as something third, which is unacceptable. Because in this case, 
one would be saying neither truth nor falsity, and there will be something beside what is and what is not, and there will be something other be change between coming to being and coming to not be, which is strictly unacceptable for Aristotle. The problem is, uh, so what Aristotle is actually saying, there are two uh, oppositions. The first is in nature, the way things are as opposed to the way things are not. The second opposition is in our thinking. We link things in our reasoning the way they are linked in nature, or we link them the, uh, the way they are linked not. The only remaining trick is to find the way to link the first opposition with the second one. If we can do it, we can arrive to uh, discern the truth and falsity. It was not so easy because uh, in the next generation of philosophers, virtually all Hellenistic philosophers rejected the law of excluded middle. And this is the common point for Stoics and academics. The only difference was that uh, academics said uh, truth and falsity are the ideal extremes never visible. We are always in between. And Stoics said in some exceptional cases, uh, the wise man can grasp the truth so that there will be no chance to take it as a false. To, uh, no way to blur the distinction. Stoics rejected at the same time Aristotle's law of excluded middle. But when they were fighting against the academic, they used this very law by Aristotle. Academics were more consistent. They said, we are always in this middle which Aristotle tried to exclude. We are always in, the, in between of truth and falsity. So I would say that uh, actually speaking about the post-truth in today's world, I cannot see how we can escape this, uh, ex uh, escape this framework, which was already explored in many, many details by uh, Hellenistic philosophers. When we, are trying, uh, when we try to jump post, past truth, we are always finding ourselves in between of truth and falsity, not beyond. And in between, the only choice we have is either truth and falsity are sometimes reachable and visible, or we stick to the position that they are, they are always invisible, and all we have is credibility. All, we have, uh, all the distinction we have is between more or less credible, more or less uh, very similar, something like, that looks like truth, but it's not necessarily true. You can live consistently in this state as Sextus Empiricus proves. It doesn't mean that you are helpless in practical life. You can be a practicing physician. You can use guidance by nature. You can use guidance you inherited by training. You can uh, allow uh, that you have some pathos from nature. This is all appearances, and you don't need to fight the appearances. You just follow the appearances. But when uh, the question is, what is behind the appearances? It's always close to us. Uh, the, well, la, my last remark about Sextus, it's interesting that he kept in mind very clearly both oppositions uh, which were important for Aristotle. I mean the opposition between the way things are and the, the way things are not in nature, and the opposition of truth and falsity in our thinking. Because Sextus uh, insisted from the very start of his Pyrrhonian hypotheposis that the main distinction we should always stick to is the distinction between uh, appearances and phenomena and nomena. Phenomena, you always follow them. Nomena, when you never know. And you, if you try to look for the truth, you, uh, there is a brilliant metaphor when Sixtus says you are like archers that are trying to shoot the target in the darkness. So maybe they are close. Maybe somebody even hits the target. 
Maybe somebody misses, but you never know who hit and who misses. Because there is always a barrier between nominal, nominal and phenomenal. So, uh, back to today, this is my claim. First, I would say that uh, in principle, we face nothing new today, which people didn't face before. We do not have any particular new challenges so that we will need new theoretical framework to deal with the challenges. There are some new features which were not available in Greek times. I would name three of them. First, the uh, situation of multiple competing meta-narratives. Greeks were facing this situation, but uh, it took many centuries after the collapse of the Greek and Roman Empire, Greek world and Roman world, bef before people accepted this situation as more or less normal one. So before the modern Europe, people always perceived the situation like this. There is one true narrative, all the meta-narrative, all the rest are false, and the only problem is to find which one is the true meta-narrative which proved to be impossible. We're always fighting, but you never know. You cannot find the proof that this religious meta-narrative is the right one. You can only believe, and you believe. When you believe this meta-narrative, you always jump over the existing evidences. So the true revolution was happened with the appearance of Protestantism, and it was related not so much to Luther and Zwingli, but to Melanchthon, who was the first uh, to suggest the idea of uh, adiaphora. That is, uh, when uh, Augsburg Confession was prepared and drafted, Mel it was Melanchthon who said uh, the first time, uh, suggested that uh, we should treat the difference, uh, different interpretations of the Holy Scripture as adiaphora. We have different ways of uh, making sense of this and this part of the Holy Scripture, and we don't know which one is the true one. And we should treat all of them as more or less credible, and we'll, we are all Christians, and we accept that we have different understanding, valid, more or less valid at once. So from this, from Melanchthon on, we have the situation of several coexisting meta-narratives. This is what we face today, and we, we just cannot know for sure which meta-narrative is the true one. They are only this gray zone between truth and falsity. The second uh, important novelty is mass media, which is we have much more powerful tools to influence each other. And now even uh, when we uh, face a factual truth, not the truth of interpretation, explanatory truth, I would say that th there is also a difference not known to Greeks. There is, uh, let's take a practical example. In 1914, uh, uh, three years ago, sorry, Russian media reported about the boy crucified in Slovensk. No such boy ever existed, or at least there is not a single eyewitness in Slovensk who would confirm this. So Russian media lied. For what purpose? One would say uh, they defended historical truth, the case of Russian Empire in the hum world history. And this was more important. This lie was justified by their fighting for the historical truth of their state. So uh, now we are lucky. We have a lot of eyewitnesses. We can fi uh, find out what is the factual truth. But in fact, in many cases, even with factual truth, we now depend on each other. We are not eyewitnesses. In most of the cases, we, uh, in our world picture, we built our world picture based on the witnesses of others, more than ever before. And we don't, we don't know for sure which witness is trustworthy, which is not. We can 
uh, find it more credible, less credible, but not all, uh, as a rule, not a zero, not a hundred percent. It's still like uh, Hellenistic philosophers say, in between, somewhere in between. So uh, nothing new in principle, but this powerfulness of these new media tools means that we are more than ever before ethically responsible for every our epistemological choice. And this is my final point. We should be, feel ourselves responsible for the consequences of every epistemological choice we make because more than ever before, our choice has practical, ethical, drastic, ruinous consequences. Thank you. Okay, so, yeah, can I start? So, uh, I would like also uh, thank you for invitation here. I came at the night, so I didn't see much of this, uh, I'm sure, beautiful uh, city, but I hope that it is not the last uh, opportunity to come here. Uh, so, uh, Speaking about uh, post-truth politics of post-politics, of course I agree that it is not really new. So I would like to start with the probably the best formulation of post-politics around the letter from 1904. Young uh, political activist, activist uh, once uh, said, in politics is only one principle and one truth. What profits my opponent hurts me, and vice versa. And it is a good description of post-politic, and it is a quotation from a letter uh, written by Vladimir Ulyanov, named Lenin, to uh, his uh, good uh, friend. So, uh, I would say that uh, Discussing about post-truth in politics of, uh, or post-politics, of course, I, I agree with this important uh, epistemolo epistemological and ontological dimension, but in my opinion, the main purpose of this discussion is the discussion about politics, about the nature of uh, politics or I don't like the name nature for this, because the politics is our invention. So it is more like discussion about which kind of politics we would like to have, which kind of politics we would like to do. And in fact, we are discussing about this. We are discussing about, uh, about politics, imagine politics and real politics. And uh, so few words about uh, politics. Of course, uh, politics is about struggle. It is not that about this. But the problem is that many people is so uh, obsessed with the politics as a struggle, they don't, they then don't uh, see the other side of politics. Cooperation, uh, cooperation, discussion, and so on. I mean, cooperation, I would, I would say, in this, um, in this moment. Because even in the most cruel politics, we need some kind of uh, cooperation. So politics is a little bit like, you know, this uh, Janus God with two faces, uh, cooperation and uh, coercion. And uh, my next step is that uh, democratic politics resolved this dilemma through introducing uh, dialogue conversation, discourse into the center of doing politics, into the center of doing uh, politics. So argumentation uh, and uh, different kind of argumentation. In my book, uh, if I can um, refer to my book, it is a politics of dialogue. Uh, I try to show that the dialogue is not much about consensus, but more about understanding, but anyway, uh, understanding is also a kind of a ethical uh, act of uh, accepting argumentation of other uh, side. Uh, and it is a quite 
clear. Late Cvetan Todorov, the famous Bulgarian French uh, uh, linguist, uh, semiotician, uh, in his concept of rhetorics, he showed very precisely that rhetorics always flourish in democratic regime. In totalitarian, authoritarian uh, regimes, uh, rhetorics uh, degenerate into so-called beautiful speech. Because, of course, there is also rhetoric is a beautiful speech, but it is not for purpose of argumentation. It is for purpose of just uh, aesthetic. So I would say that the most uh, important here is that uh, post uh, politics is a kind of, uh, metaphorically speaking, virus of democracy. Because it, uh, this argumentation uh, 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 enters the cell of real argumentation and change it. So it is very difficult to uh, to, the, uh, uh, to detect, to detect uh, this, uh, because it pretends to be real argumentation, or sometimes it is even real argumentation, but with a twist, <laughs> I would say. So if we uh, describe uh, politics, democratic politics, as a kind of uh, self-limited war, where instead, so like this, uh, uh, let's say, uh, antagonistic, agonistic uh, differentiation. So uh, instead of uh, fighting, there is the argumentation. Instead of uh, battle is election, it's instead of, of war. Then uh, post-truth of post-truth uh, argumentation is, is a very important uh, game uh, changer game changer and it change uh, politics in the same way like the card sharper can change uh, card play. I mean, still there is a play. I mean, this is the poker, but if the card uh, sharper shuler is uh, present, it is a different, uh, different uh, 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 game. But, what, but uh, what is the most uh, tragic in this story, of course, is that if uh, Kurt Sharper is to be successful, all other people have to be honest, or at least less deceptive. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> Um, and therefore, uh, 
what we are watching, uh, we are watching uh, a problem of uh, lack of uh, representation and then uh, <coughs> simultaneous desire to, uh, to be voiced uh, in the uh, democratic uh, society or I don't know any single society that among these uh, contemporary liberal societies who would say they are not democratic enough. Even, even those who are who we doubt are democratic. They all claim to be democratic. And so democracy is here in question again. Uh, our understanding democracy, our relation to democracy, and also our relation to what means to be a citizen in a free society, what means to be a subject of a political discourse. Um, so now uh, we start a discussion. I uh, ask you uh, to present yourself, to name yourself. And uh, if you have questions or comments, please. Uh... My name is Lerbin, Institute of Liberty. Okay. Uh, so I have some questions, but I ask not all of them, but uh, what you, uh, you described a huge landscape of opinion we talk about politics, we talk about philosophy. Uh, so what we, we are a like, citizen, uh, citizen of Ukraine in such difficult field, uh, find the path to help to go through this landscape. For example, we must uh, back for the, to the roots, uh, study Greek philosophy, <laughs> for example, or try to it's understand what, this, uh, what democracy or liberalism means, really. So, what we can do now in this most strange you know, situation in Ukraine? Can I say a few, a few words? Uh, the, the, a brief answer would be to master logic and critical thinking. Uh, by the way, I would disagree that we are sp when we are speaking about democratic politics, we are not speaking about epistemology. This is what, what Greeks face it. What, uh, when you have public policy, you can find a demagogue, master of uh, unjust laws, who can persuade you to uh, pass by the majority some suicidal decision, some very ruinous decision. So what, what you can do to prevent it? The only thing is to think critically, to think logically, and when your logic stops and you have to make a choice as between the competing meta-narratives, at least to uh, understand it clearly for yourself what meta-narrative you are fighting for, what you select. If there is a choice, not just a logical proof, just make your choice clearly. And then we shall see whether your choice uh, is in accord with the course of human history or it opposes the general course of human history. The, I mean the Russian-Ukrainian contradictions of today. So the Russian side, they are staying for their meta-narrative, their understanding of history. We believe it's wrong. Only history can show which one is. It's not the question of logic. It's not the question of uh, uh, epistemological procedure, procedures that can show you clearly which side is right, which side is wrong. We can only believe that history is on our side, not on the side of the Russian Empire. But at least, may, in this situation, at least make your choice clear. And whenever it's possible to refer to logic and logical proofs, use it as much as you can. This is the only uh, solution I can suggest. Um, I don't know if my colleagues will agree with me, but my feeling is that the false truth is not such a big problem for Ukraine specifically. Because we ran through, we have some, like, some experience of existential truth. The Maidan and subsequent war is a very revealing experience. When you somehow, even if you do not know, you feel the difference between fake and some truth like capital T. What is our problem that our version of events, how we feel it, and we are very emotionally involved in that, existentially involved, is presented 
internationally as an opinion. As one of versions, which is equal to the Russian or Polish or I don't know, Italian, whatever. Somehow, so we feel the difference, they do not. And we lack the language and capacities to, to articulate it properly. Okay? And another side of the problem is that it's in our interest to combat the false truth globally. And what can be done, because I believe it is a hard, like a burning issue for Western democracies precisely. What has to be done? I see two big problems and they are sort of ways out. But you rightly pointed out that first, we are missing uh, the normative horizons. What you said, like being sincere to yourself is a new truth, new paradigm of truth. Which means that I have nothing to strive for. It's like entire enlightenment. I don't have to get better. It's okay to be true to yourself, even if you are ignorant, narrow-minded, and whatever. So politics is missing normative horizons. That's a problem. And another issue is um, that we have a big comeback of emotions into politics. Counter to impersonal, institutional, liberal technocracy, now we have like a lot of emotional politics. And what is very disseminated these days is politics of anger. And my feeling is that it has to be replaced with the ethos of empathy. Okay, so it's another kind of emotions, some solid emotions, but it's not a communal parochial solidarity, but a sort of empathy towards one another. So that would be my take here. Thank you. Well, I mean, the first question is, when Chanishevsky's or Lenin's question, what, to be what is to be done? <laughs> Telegraph, telephone, <laughs> that's it. And, uh, and I think here, if we are with Lenin, I mean, the definition of politics is who did what to whom, is namely part of politics, is very much part of the story. So the problem with logic and reasonable arguments and deliberation and deliberative democracy, and that's what is, I think, is now what we are discussing, and in a way it is new, is the impotence. The, feel, the feeling that deliberative democracy is not strong enough politically. It's not backed by, it doesn't meet masses of people who just find it even bizarre that people take arguments and, and logical fallacies seriously. I mean, they all think, well, it's not about this, it's about that, you missed the point. So the question, what is to be done, is first of all, it's a political question about power, namely how to give power to deliberation, how to make deliberation and deliberation in democracy uh, something which is, can be politically powerful. So I would divide the question what is to be done into two questions. One is what is to be done when you can do something. The other question is what can be done when there is nothing to do? You are too weak and you lack power. Then there is a retreat, a stoic retreat to the inner citadel of be logical with your life, care about your life, your family, your children, and forget about the rest. And withdraw seeing things. With logic as part of it, and rational thinking. So, saying that in Ukraine, of course, is not a big problem means that the feeling is there is no fatalistic feeling. There is something can be done, and uh, can people can get organized and be heard, and be then held rationally. That's a strong claim. In many places, the, the fatalism comes from the feeling 
that the question is what can be done when there is nothing to be done. I understood your question in the first sense, that there is still something to be done in Ukraine. So, good luck. <laughs> I would say almost the same, good luck, because, uh, you know, I am not, uh, not so uh, familiar with uh, complicated Ukrainian uh, politics, and of course, you know, the war and so on is probably the situation which uh, changed the whole trajectory of, to say, uh, normal politics, but uh, what I am interested in now, uh, and it is a little bit what you said about this emotion, anger, and so on. And I am uh, also interested in, uh, how to say, rationality of mass protests and mass movements. Because we have, in political theory, a uh, long um, narrative of very black narrative about masses. Uh, so the democracy is uh, about rationality and the mass protests are something which uh, which is uh, dangerous uh, for democracy, because there is, uh, of course, the Le bon and so on uh, question. So even, you know, I, but I think that it is uh, one of the probably biggest uh, mistake which was done, at least in Poland, uh, that uh, people accepted uh, the kind of democracy as a kind of uh, administra administration of things uh, without any reference to ideal. So my, my favorite example is uh, very interesting, but I would say that very deceptive uh, essay by Adam Michnik, famous dissident, democracy is grey. He said, we should accept that democracy is boring, uh, nothing interesting and so on, and it is, of course, we are, as a dissident who fought for many years for democracy, we are very happy with this. Probably he was, but and he is, but the problem is that people are not. Because uh, if democracy is grey, if democracy is boring, so what is the reason to fight for democracy? And this is the, the problem. So I would say that, of course, populist, mass protest, and so on, there is a lot of uh, strange, dangerous things in, the, in this. But anyway, we should look at this, because... Uh, Again, I would say that politics is also about everyday life. What uh, Amishai also said, that uh, rationality stop at some point. People are happy because of their, uh, their lives. And if we exclude this from our uh, discourse of politics, it became very, uh, very dangerous. So I, I agree that we should look for empathy as a kind of a, a counterpoint to, uh, to anger. But we should, to, to have empathy, we should look very carefully in, uh, at anger. What is the, the most important in, in anger? And I think that we, I mean, uh, it is a little bit my theoretical obsession now, how we can transform this uh, mass protest uh, dialogue into, let's say, normal civil uh, society uh, discourse. Just a word about empathy. I think that we should distinguish between empathy and empathy. Even a, a sadist who can have a, an empathy, namely understanding how things look from your point of view. But the, and therefore be more, even more devious and more cruel because you know, he or she understands what it means to be in your shoes. Sympathy means to be, to understand what is to be in your shoes and be with you and solidarity in the sense being with you. Empathy, empathy is actually, uh, every, I mean, empathy is not enough. So what do we basically, since solidarity, the word was so tainted, uh, so people go into empathy. The world is still solidarity. And I think that's the, the answer. Solidarity on what basis, national basis, on average, that's a big issue. But what the, the, 
I think that what we are looking is to make sense of fraternité, namely the revolutionary triangle of equality and freedom and liberty. I mean, they too, we basically, we try to deal with it. A political activity has to do with these two basic values. And when justice is the right balance between equality and liberty. But the point is that there is no activism and you cannot motivate the people unless there is a sense of solidarity. That's why Maidan was so important. It was a first sort of sense of solidifying solidarity. And I want the fact that this world was tainted I think should be resurrected and not just find empathy is really for empathy is really for psychiatrists and not for political activists. Thank you. Uh, just I would like to make two short remarks to what my colleagues just said. First about the witness of democracy. I know one disciple of Aristotle would strongly agree with what you said about the, the weakness of a deliberate democracy. He would say that his authoritarian rule is much stronger, but as you know from the history, it didn't last much, much long. It was very bright, just for maybe 10, 15 years, and then it all ended. So democracy can be weak in the short run, but democracy is, has much more capacities to survive for, in, in the long run. The problem, and here I agree with you, is uh, not that democracy is weak. The weakness of democracy is that indeed, when it is successful enough, it can be bored of itself. And this is something very deep in human nature. It's not just a political question, it's ethical and aesthetical question. Because uh, the first uh, example that comes to my mind it's very difficult, maybe impossible, to describe the paradise just as vividly as you describe hell. This, is, this was the problem for Dante. So we humans are looking for contradictions. And the, uh, more, uh, the suspicion number one we have about paradise is that it can be boring. Because it's too not non-contradictory for us. So and this is, I, I believe, this is part of the answer uh, why Trump is so popular. He makes it a show. He's not boring. There is something interesting going on, something unusual, something new, bright, but it's very dangerous because going this way, we can make a nuclear explosion just for fun, just for, because it's bright, because it's unusual. And this is the uh, red line uh, where still have uh, to find some solution how to draw it and not to cross it just just for fun because the consequences would be too drastic just uh, just one comment uh, recently there was some sort of book about Eric Tarr, the age of uh, delirium in the ukrainian and russian and um, by publishing now and um, did a good point made a good point uh, saying that this age of delirium, we, as uh, referring to what uh, Valeria said, um, we are used to this society with double standards, something that for Western democracies is uh, quite uh, uh, new and uh, is something that they have to face and to critically rethink. We are used to this, uh, you know, checking the reality for reality. For, uh, we are used to politicians who would say something and we would presume something different. However, um, we are in risk now because uh, I think um, one, one of the things that we obtained with Maidan was the sense that we might change something and we are changing the society, it's transforming. But on the other hand, um, the transformation happens uh, but still there are politicians like, let's say, Yulia Tymoshenko, who are very populist, and the critical thinking does not come with Maidan. It's not something given to, uh, as a virtue to a citizen who wants to participate um, 
liberally uh, fully into political into the democratic processes and a number of people are willingly uh, following uh, politicians that they might guess that they are, are being cheated by these politicians but still they want to hear what they want to hear and they would follow and I'm, uh, I'm uh, guessing we might be at risk again uh, uh, in new um, in new uh, presidential elections exactly because uh, this is a tendency to seek for quick solutions for uh, easy answers and uh, that's that's a big risk to say uh, that we have big seen or we we have uh, some sense that will preserve us from that mistake so uh, also like uh, two uh, comments uh, one uh, about solidarity, which is of course very important, but as Avishai said, it is uh, tainted. I would say that there is no democracy without uh, solidarity, but we, c we should understand solidarity not of unification. I mean, the, 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 the charm of solidarity is that I am solidary with the people I don't agree with. There is something different, and probably the uh, the, 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 the biggest mistake in Polish politics was to look at solidarity as something which unified people. I mean, unified, but not in the reason. So the solidarity is, uh, means that we can have different, like with brother, fraternité. And of course, this is not a coincidence that fraternité is the most difficult from this uh, trial uh, uh, to, to explain. So it is like with brother. I can't. Uh, of course, and very often we don't agree with our uh, brothers, sisters, and so on. But anyway, we uh, we are solidary with uh, 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 with them. So we. Uh, uh, but anyway, I uh, I fully agree that it is not enough to have uh, how to say formal rules for democracy to exist. But we need uh, solidarity as something uh, underlying democracy. And this is the one. Uh, remark and the second is, uh, but it was uh, you, you you formulated this very clearly, but also Abishai uh, and so on about populism, mm -hmm. and then we have a dilemma in uh, Europe, at least in European, but maybe also in American uh, politics, what to do with a populist movement. The one possibility is to, <laughs> which is called in economy, in business, to hostile takeover of populist slogans. And it was done, for instance, in a Dutch election. The prime minister took slogans and then, then he attracted people. But it is, of course, a very dangerous uh, strategy because if you pretend to be uh, populist but not to be, you know, it is very, very, very um, uh, thin line between pretending and being uh, in real. In real. The second, which I recommend, but it is, uh, it is uh, now the, the hottest point in uh, this political discussion in Poland. How to stop uh, peace, how to stop law and justice uh, party. Because they are extremely popular. They, they, they liquidate uh, tribunal court, they are going to liquidate uh, Supreme Court and so on, but they are <laughs> more and more popular. There is a lot of demonstration against them, but uh, now I think that the, the, the last uh, sociological poll showed that it is uh, more than 50% of people uh, supporting them. So the, the opposition is now in uh, despair, and they are trying to do, uh, because you know, they, they offer people something, so maybe we should offer more and more. But uh, anyway, I think that, uh, of course, we are not, I am not going to resolve this discussion because it is not, uh, you know, in problem of uh, only intellectual problem, or deliberative problem, it is a problem of uh, politics, emotion and so on. But anyway, <coughs> what I would uh, recommend to look at these problems which uh, uh, make them so popular and try to found democratic <coughs> solution uh, to this, not just to uh, to go uh, for auction, I mean, in the sense that we, we, we can offer better. But it is, it is very difficult, it is very difficult right now, so, uh, so 
I would like to. It is very difficult. <laughs> Probably I hold several remarks to clarify my position. By no means I'm not an apologist of Ukraine. I'm not trying to say that everything is very nice running in Ukraine. No. What I was trying to say that Maidan was a very important experience of revelation of some sort of existential truth. And roughly it's uh, the only legacy we've got at the moment, which somehow prevents the Ukrainian society against backsliding to what we had before. Because in terms of institutional or normal politics, we are not doing great at all. And um, there are many reasons for that, so I didn't make a claim that the liberation of the soul was somehow, so I don't want you to get me wrong. Uh, we are facing a lot of problems these days. And uh, one of them, I think Ukrainians share with uh, Eastern Europeans, is a sort of cargo cult of democracy. When we have some sort of magical thinking about democracy, when we do not understand how it actually works, <coughs> but we are thinking that once we claim that we, are, we have democracy, we'll have all our problems solved. You know, like the Borogens who build this airplane, thinking that they will give them some goods or something like that. Uh, so we don't understand that it's a mundane work, that it's very demanding and requiring. So, okay, we adopt a democracy. Oh, we are doing badly. Let's keep it. So this way of thinking, I'm very exaggerating right now, but I think it's a sort of common fallacy of these all new democracies, um, like to compare to the Swiss referendum about the minimum income that they refuse to do so because they understand what's the mechanism and what's the cost. And I would say that if we had such a referendum, we would vote differently. Yeah. Um, and secondly, the second point, which is about the core of our discussion from my perspective, that um, a, an intuitional way out of the post-truth is to reinforce truth, to reclaim the monopoly on truth. And it is very dangerous, because we do have to keep the polyphony of politics by all means. And I think it's also Michnik's idea, and it's also a very urgent problem for, for the Polish society. And I'm very happy that you touched upon this idea of liberty, equality, uh, fraternity, because this is my theoretical obsession. And I do think that the third part of the slogan of the French Revolution has still a lot of potential to, to somehow reinforce the whole project of modernity. Thank you. Shall I ask? Uh, yes, uh, maybe the audience wants to, or somebody wants to say something. So we are not. Okay. I would like to address something about back to truth, democracy, and why. It's called the liberal position, is in, is problematic, and why it's vulnerable. Liberalism, among other things, one of the virtues means toleration. Now, to tolerate seriously is to tolerate the errors and the mistakes of others. and feel, unless they harm other people, but people make their own decisions regarding themselves, even if we believe that they are terribly wrong. Uh, now, toleration can become out of indifference. I don't care about other people do your stuff. But the question is, when we care about other people, and we know that they are going to do a terrible mistake. Mm -hmm. I mean, you keep bringing his companion to the family, and you saw that he or she are no good, and you see that it's that your kid is blind, and you know the continuation, and yet you have to respect his or her decision. That's really hard. That's a tough one when you really care and you want. And, you, 
and to give and to respect the sovereignty or the autonomy of others to make their own mistakes, that's the hard core of toleration. So on the one hand, we want high level of toleration to mistakes and errors of others. On the other hand, we want to respect to the truth. And we want to advance. And this is a source of vulnerability, which is not always in the instincts of many people is they take toleration just as a sign of indifference. People who were tired for persecuting others or all right, let's have them. And that was the end of the religious wars. Toleration came out because people were tired of the wars after so many years. But the point about toleration, that it means seriously taking the autonomy of others seriously, and have, they have their rights for their own life, that's a hard one for many people to take. So populism also is, I think, I mean, appeal to this thing that as if there is deep down in liberal democracy deep down a core of indifference. So solidarity has to counter the sense of indifference. That's really why, why it is important. And uh, I think I try to address, I mentioned my last book on betray, and that's I started with a revolutionary triangle and the relation between okay. and uh, so <coughs> I'm not here to advertise my book but, uh, but Why not? that's a because I'm not <laughs> <laughs> so you that, have verses no, no, but, but, uh, but when you mentioned that's exactly what worried me so So again, uh, to your remarks about uh, democracy, I mean, uh, the first is that the problem with democracy is that democracy is both ideal and practice. So, for instance, people who suffer in, in totalitarian regimes for democracy, they, they usually don't think about, you know, such and such system of voting and so on. I, they have to think about democracy as something ideal, better world and so on and so on. And of course, this uh, mistake you, you said, I mean, it is true, I mean, uh, it is the, the same what uh, we uh, had in Poland, is uh, to some extent justified, justified by the, uh, by the past. And then, of course, the, uh, it is an inevitable uh, big collision between reality as an imaginary sense of uh, democracy, which we encounter at the beginning of 90s in a very drastic way. The second problem is this imitation. Of course, we have uh, the same discussion in Poland in, uh, I think, I don't remember, 1994, very, very early. Uh, Alexander Smoller wrote a long essay which was very uh, popular about imitative character of Polish transformation that we just took and so on. But, uh, and this is an endless discussion about this in, in Poland. But in my opinion, uh, I don't think that a good imitation sometimes is not, is not bad. Because now uh, the problem is uh, what is the alternative, local alternative. For instance, in Poland, the right wing, and this is a little bit like the official, uh, the official ideology of peace. Uh, the, 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 the ideology is that we should look at our tradition of, Demo of democracy, let's say, gentle democracy in the 17th, 18th century, so called summation demo uh, democracy. Uh, and and they, they call sometimes this as a republican democracy, so democracy based on, on virtue. But one of the virtues is, uh, is let's say, uh, accepting the Catholic uh, system of values. So the, the, the next step is to say that Democratic citizen of Poland should accept these uh, values. Of course, he can be believer or not. They, they usually don't ask about going to church. But anyway, if you don't accept this set of values, 
you are practically excluded from Republican, uh, Republican democracy. So I am, uh, I am very, uh, very afraid uh, about this. I can uh, understand the motivation and I can understand, for example, there is a uh, very huge book written by the Polish right-wing uh, sociologist who is the member of uh, Euro European Parliament, Krasnodemski, he, he called the democrat, uh, demo what is that? Peripheric yeah. democracy, yeah. And uh, the, the, this is the idea that, uh, you know, the democracy on periphery should uh, look at the local uh, sources and so on. I mean, on one hand it is, uh, it is okay. Uh, democracy is, of course, not, uh, there is no like an essence of democracy. But on the other hand, at least in the current uh, politics of Poland, uh, I am rather uh, uh, prone to be very, uh, very careful about uh, imposing this kind of a submission Republican uh, democracy in our country. I want to return back to the question of interrelations between politics and epistemology. And uh, I would uh, propose or suggest a strange thing. I would say that authoritarian regimes are less epistemologically complicated than democracy. Democracy uh, is epistemologically more complicated. Because in authoritarian regime, there is always one meta-narrative which we claim to be full and complete and final truth, and the rest are all false. And for democracy, it is a temptation. Temptation presented in Ukraine by Yulia Timoshenko. They are fighting all and wide for the truth. It's very dangerous, actually. But the, uh, another extreme, and also a temptation and danger, is to say, if this is not the final truth, then all are only opinions, and all are equally great. As you said, the Russian opinion, Russian version, Ukrainian version, uh, it's also a temptation. And to receive this, we should just remind ourselves that we cannot be neutral to this uh, contradistinction of opinions because we are also inside of this contradiction. So when you say that this is just an opinion, this is just an opinion, you should, uh, rem uh, you should remember that every answer you have, every choice you have applies to your own life it's, uh, also. So when European, uh, Europe our European colleagues say that we cannot make a choice between Russian version of events and Ukrainian version of events. Next question is, what would you think about Europe? Because your attitude to Russian case and Ukrainian case is also your attitude to Europe itself. It's all about what is Europe in this case. Does it fit with Russian meta-narrative or Ukrainian meta-narrative? Do you, do you believe that uh, history is uh, the constant fight between meta super civilizations or you believe in the final uh, moving uh, history towards liberalism and democracy it's your choice and it's responsible choice and uh, speaking about peace and how to deal with this there is one optimistic uh, expectation and is the, uh, it is that authoritarian regimes or regimes are uh, which are moving uh, from democracy, from the liberal democracy, usually run out of money sooner yeah, but, uh, than democratic <laughs> regimes. So with with peace, just whole population, unfortunately. <laughs> well, uh, fifty percent plus something are supporting peace. Let's wait for some years, and they will run out of money. Yeah, for sure. Because of spoiling relations yeah. with their neighbors, yeah. and then people re reconcile. Hopefully, but. I'm afraid that it will be a catastrophe for all of them. Just you know, trying to make an argument with you, like being devil's advocate, I would say that uh, these days liberal intellectuals are very prone to sort of complacency. And all these ways of thinking, let's wait, they will defeat themselves for any reasons, intellectually, financially, or whatever. I think it's a very comfortable retreat responsibility to do something about it. Because frankly speaking, I'm not confident that they will face a defeat 
by them, I mean like populist, anti-democrats, anti-liberal, illiberal democracy, whatever you call it. So I do suggest to take it seriously and responsibly. And secondly, um, about epistemology and politics, um, again, let me disagree because I started from making a distinction between um, scientific truth and political opinions. And I do believe that science has to keep an autonomy from politics. And in totalitarian regimes, it is not autonomous. That's why it's sort of out of epistemology. And sociology of knowledge showed it like quite early in the 20th century. If politics intervenes into science, then knowledge transfers into ideology. Okay, so uh, I, I do not feel comfortable about epistemological <laughs> aspects of politics and how it doesn't <laughs> fit uh, from my perspective. And, and then going back to the Polish case, uh, I share your concerns here. I spent some time in Poland and because I, I'm very yeah, interested in the same, the Solidarność movement, obviously, and, and the... Artes Liberale, yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> um, and from my perspective, it's a very important case. Uh, you know, a Harvard scholar, Roman Sparluk, wrote a good book, which is called, like, How Friedrich List Beats Karl Marx. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very important point that these days it turned out that people with low income and with lower level of education tend not to be solidar with the same people in other countries, like this sort of idea of the revolution of proletariat or whatever, but they tend to become very parochial and to stick to their local identity and to close up. Yeah. So in this case, it is anti-Marxian. And this is a very strong argument from my perspective against Chantal idea that you can invent some sort of leftist populism and to catch up with this audience. No, because people do stick with local and national identities and that's very dangerous. Thank you. Well, Many issues <laughs> 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 uh, raised here. I'm less, I mean, the, you have a triumphalist attitude towards truth and the liberation. <laughs> and, uh, and there was even an idea at the end of communism. You cannot have perestroika without glasnost. And the whole Chinese challenge is exactly to that. You can have perestroika without glasnost. If you are strong enough, organized enough, you do. I'm not. You mentioned Aristotle, the law of excluded middle. But the law of excluded middle in Aristotle is not, doesn't apply to future sentences. You can see that. So I'm not saying that whether, it will, whether the Chinese will, whether it, the experiment will last or it won't last. Because here I'm willing to say there is no law of excluded middle on future, future contingent. What I'm saying is there is, that, there is no teleologic here in history, and I don't, it's one damn thing after another, and I don't, and it can go in many directions. And I think if you try to understand what is the Chinese challenge, is exactly there can be perestroika without Glasnost. And Glasnost, I'm namely open, an open society can be defeated. And can be defeated for a long time. What will be sort of in the very long time, as Cain said, in the long time we shall all be dead. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much. Uh, many points have been raised here now, and uh, uh, I just want—I want to finish that with this. Uh, Care for the other, uh, the, about the toleration and care for the other. Uh, there is a word uh, in Greek, paredia. Paredia is truth telling. 
uh, through talent, but in a brave way. Um, Parezia is about telling the truth to the people who do not want to know the truth, but who are uh, essentially, they are ready to hear this, but they, of course, nobody of us wants to get the truth. And the Parezias is risking his life when he tells the truth. And uh, we are, in somehow, we are in a very similar position today. We are in a position when we talk about post-truth, but really, we are reinform reinforcing the role of the truth and the uh, value of the truth and continuity and also of our personal responsibility for that truth to be spelled out and reinforced. And uh, I think this, uh, this discussion just in some way it showed this, but it's also, um, we should not avoid the conversation about this post-truth. Uh, in, in the sense, uh, avoiding the post-truth discussions, we, we are falling into, uh, into risk of uh, missing something really important, and that is care for the other and for the self. Because in the end, care for the other will always end uh, care for the self, for, for our own future, for our own country, for ourselves as citizens and people. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, for your participation and for your, uh, I missed the English word for that, uh, um, got uh, input, yeah. input yeah. into this discussion, yes, thank you very much. So uh, thank you, Arisha, for... Thank you.